When I was a teenager, I went to my doctor and I explained that I, uh, you know, had this, this feeling like pain was leaking out of me. I couldn't control it or regulate it. I felt very embarrassed by it. And my doctor told me an entirely biological story about why I felt this way. He said, there's a chemical called serotonin in people's brains. It makes people feel good. Some people are naturally lacking it. You're clearly one of them. Uh, we just need to give you some drugs and you'll, they'll boost your serotonin levels. You'll feel better. So I started taking the drugs and I felt an immediate and huge boost, right? For a couple of months, I felt great. And then this feeling of pain started to bleed back through. So I went back to the doctor. He said, clearly didn't give you a high enough dose, gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. I started to, by that time I was experiencing some quite powerful side effects. I was putting on a huge amount of weight, but I'd felt better. Uh, again, the pain bled through and I was in this cycle of being given higher and higher doses until for 13 years I took the maximum dose you can possibly take. At the end of which, I was still depressed, right? I had experienced some boost from the drugs initially, but I was still depressed. And I wanted to understand, well, what's going on here? I'm doing what I'm told to do, right? I also had a therapist. But the bigger mystery for me is why were there so many other people like me? I'm 39 years old. Almost every year I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased across the Western world, right? And I thought, at some level, from quite early on, although I, I really resisted this insight, I didn't let it into my head very much, I thought, it can't just be a chemical imbalance. Why would it be rising so much if it was just a chemical imbalance? That didn't seem intuitively right. So until I was a te when I was a teenager, until I went to my doctor, I thought my depression was all in my head. Meaning, I don't think this phrase existed then, but I needed to man up, right? I was just being weak, you know, I need to pull myself together. And then for the next 13 years, I thought it was all in my head in a very different way. That actually, it was a chemical imbalance in my brain. It was a malfunction in my skull. And what I learned in the research for Lost Connections and speaking to the leading experts in the world on this is there are real biological factors that make you more vulnerable to depression and anxiety for sure, and I go through what they are. But actually, mostly, according to the World Health Organization, the leading body in the world, according to the leading doctor at the United Nations, the causes are mostly not in our heads. They're mostly in the way we're living. So I learned there's scientific evidence for nine causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are biological, but the rest are social and psychological. They're not just in our minds, they're in the way we live, they're in the way we're taught, they're in the way we interact with other people. Um, and, and that opens up a very different kind of solution to depression and anxiety, very different paths out, which should be offered, it's important to say, alongside chemical antidepressants, which do give some relief to some people as they gave me some relief for a short time. So we are one of the loneliest societies that has ever been. There's a study that asks Americans, there are similar trends for Britain, they're not quite as extreme, but they're getting there. Ask Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing those studies years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer, not the average, but the most common answer is none. So you think about what it's like to be, and I see this all the time, I travel around the US a lot of the time. What is it like to be alone? You know, and, and, and one of the people who really helped me to understand this is a wonderful man called Professor John Cassiopo, who's at the University of Chicago, who I interviewed a lot. He is the, the leading expert on loneliness in the world. He made incredible scientific breakthroughs mm. on this. And, and he, for example, demonstrated, so when we're stressed as human beings, we release a, a hormone called cortisol. He showed that um, being acutely lonely releases as much cortisol as being punched in the face by a stranger. Right? This is how terrible the experience of loneliness is for human beings. Professor Cassiopo explained to me, one of the reasons you and I exist is because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down, they weren't, um, but they, they weren't stronger than the animals they took down. They were much better at banding together in tribes and cooperating, right? That, they were brilliant at it. And every instinct we have as human beings is to do that, right? Just like bees evolved to need a hive, humans evolved to need a tribe. And, and we are the first human beings to try to disband our tribes and live alone, tell ourselves we can do it ourselves. And as Professor Cassiopo put it to me, in the circumstances where human beings evolved, if you were separated from the tribe, you were depressed and anxious for a really good reason. You were in terrible danger. Those are our evolved instincts. Now, I mention that because we've got two things there. Professor Cassiopo proved that loneliness causes depression and anxiety. And there's overwhelming social science evidence that loneliness has significantly increased. 
So I think that tells us that's a contribute. It's certainly not the only explanation. There's a lot more things going on, but it helps us to understand why there would be one of the reasons why there would be a rising depression and anxiety crisis. There are people who've tried to build different ways of responding to depression around these insights. So an amazing man, one of the heroes of Lost Connections, called Dr. Sam Everington. Sam is a general practitioner. He was just really uncomfortable because, like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He gives them out sometimes. But he had loads of people coming to him with depression and anxiety, and he could see they were really lonely. A lot of the other factors that I talk about cause depression and anxiety were playing out in their lives. And he could see that while antidepressants gave people some relief sometimes, they were not solving the problem for a lot of them. So he decided to pioneer a different approach. One day, a woman who I got to know quite well called Lisa Cunningham came to see Sam. Lisa had been shut away in her home for seven years. She'd barely left, crippling depression and anxiety. And Sam said to her, don't worry, I'm going to carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to try something else. I'm going to prescribe something different. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group, right? It was an area behind the doctor's surgery. It was known as dog crap alley. That's not the word they used. It was just kind of scrub land where dogs would go and mess. And Sam said to Lisa, what I want you to do is turn up twice a week. I'll come and support you. Other people from the surgery will come and support you. Meet with a group of other depressed and anxious people. And we're going to turn this alley into a beautiful garden, right? First meeting, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety, right? But several things happened. Firstly, they had something to talk about that wasn't how bad they felt, right? They had something to talk about. We're going to learn gardening. They didn't know anything about gardening, right? They started to put their fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons. There's a huge amount of evidence that that exposure to the natural world is a very powerful antidepressant. They also realized as they got to know each other, they did what human beings do when we form tribes and groups. They started to solve each other's problems. So for example, one of the, this is an extreme example, but one of the people in the group was sleeping on the bus. Everyone else in the group was like, well, of course you're depressed, you're sleeping on a bus. They started lobbying the local council to get him housed. They got him housed. It was the first time most of them had done something for someone else in years. That made them feel really good. And the way Lisa put it to me, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a very similar program that found it was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for kind of obvious reason, right? It was dealing with some of the deep underlying reasons why they were depressed in the first place. It was dealing with their disconnection from other people. It was dealing with their disconnection from the natural world. It doesn't deal with all of the nine causes of depression and anxiety, right back and lost connections, but those are two really, really crucial ones and two that have, we know there's very strong evidence have risen. For something as complex as depression and anxiety, it would be absurd to say there's one solution. And part of my criticism of what we've done up to now, think about what my doctor told me. And actually one of my nephews, his best friend who's 18, three or four weeks ago, I was told he went to the doctor for help with depression and anxiety. The doctor said, oh, you're lacking dopamine in your brain. And I thought, Jesus, 20 years. And the only migration that's been made in what GPs are saying, in this case, there are better GPs than this clearly, uh, is I was told it's a serotonin depletion, he's told it's a dopamine depletion. You know, um, so what we need to do are tell more complex and truthful stories about depression that acknowledge the many factors that are going on and we need to deal with all of those factors as best we can and there's a whole range of ways we can, we can do that. I mean there's a study here in Britain I think is extraordinary, it found the average British child now spends less time outdoors than the average maximum security prisoner because by law a maximum security prisoner has to have 70 minutes and most British kids don't get that, right? So you think about it, we've, we've raised these kids as prisoners, right? Actually worse than our prisoners in that respect. It, to me, the interesting thing is to think about the moment when the internet arrives. You think about that moment, a lot of the things that cause depression and anxiety had already been massively increasing. So we already talked about one, loneliness, that was spiking well before the internet. But what happens is the internet appears and it looks a lot like the things we've lost, right? You've lost your friends, well here's some Facebook friends. You've lost your status, here's a status update, right? But in a way it's like a parody of the thing we lost, or it's like a hologram of the thing we've lost. It's not that it has no purpose or value, it does have some value, clearly. In a way, I think the relationship between social media and social life is like a bit like the relationship between porn and sex. No one spends an hour looking at porn and at the end of it feels satisfied and valued and held the way you do after sex. If it's too much of your social life, it's just not going to meet your deeper needs, right? And this goes to one of the key insights that connects so many of the causes of depression and anxiety that I write about in Lost Connections, not all of them, but most of them, which was everyone watching this program knows that you have natural physical needs, right? You need food, you need water, 
you need clean air, you need shelter. If I took those things away from you, you would be in real trouble real fast, right? There's equally strong evidence that human beings just have natural psychological needs, right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. Our culture is good at lots of things. I'm glad to be alive today, but we've been getting less good at meeting these underlying psychological needs for really large numbers of people. This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Reading books is great, but I've talked about this many times before. Many books are written very inefficiently and should be much, much shorter than they are. Not only that, sometimes you just don't have the time to read a whole book, or you might want to just go back and review the main ideas without reading the whole thing again. This is why I use and recommend Blinkist. It's a great app that takes information from the best books and condenses it to 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. For someone looking to learn, I really think this might be one of the best apps out there right now. I recommend starting with a summary for any book on the Fight Mediocrity Beginner's Reading List, or any of the books that are in my Blinkist library right now. If that sounds good, head over to Blinkist.com slash Fight Mediocrity or click the link in the description below. You can give it a try for 7 days completely free, and if you don't want to continue, you can cancel at any time. As a Fight Mediocrity viewer, you'll also get 25% off if you decide you want the full membership. Thanks for watching.